With a not too young to run bill passed, the number one job in the land is now open to people over the age of 35. On our very first episode, we spoke to a young Nigerian man, Chike Ukegu, who has dreams of becoming the president of Nigeria. My name is Isabella Akinshaye, and this is Political Politica, politics for everyone. Political Politica with Isabella Akinshe. On today's episode, I will be discussing politics and the big plan she has for Nigeria if she is voted into power come February 2019. She is a legal practitioner, businesswoman, and a politician, the founder of the National Interest Party, NIP. She is a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, a solicitor of England and Wales, an international arbitrator, a management consultant, and an entrepreneur. She studied agricultural economics at the University of Ibadan in Oyo State, business administration in Germany, French, German, and Spanish languages in different countries in Europe, filmmaking, acting, and communication skills in the United States of America. Her name is Eunice Atuejide. Welcome to Political Politica. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. And you look amazing. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank Always you. Always great to start on a positive note. Even though our topic of the day is a bit negative, it's quite negative. Voter intimidation. What do you make of voter intimidation? Oh, that's a horrible thing. Like, I have, until this whole coming into Nigerian politics thing, I never really understood what tragedy we were living through i don't know what to say like it's horrible it's like the worst thing you can imagine i'm I'm going to be voting in february and march and i'm already so scared of what could happen to me when i'll be tear gassed or beaten off or dragged around or told told off and all because i want to vote somebody other than whoever the person that is harassing me wants me to vote for i think it's something we need to do something quickly about like obviously it's always the party in power that intimidates and uh, harasses the voters but we do need to do something you about it's it only the party in power or would you say it's across board like well uh, when, when you PDP talk about was the in power, i think they did it quite a bit it may not be as brazen as they are doing it with the apc people but i think it's more um, the purview of whoever is in power because when they are in power they feel like they are immune to whatever the laws are and nobody can really do anything about them so they do it openly at least that was what happened in the second elections in uh, Oshun State you could tell that it didn't matter what the people really wanted to do they were mandated to behave in certain ways and those who had the guts to refuse were maltreated and even people who didn't have any business with what the elections they too were malhandled we could see journalists getting beaten up we could see observers getting harassed we could see like it was really really horrible with this or should we run and it's kind of scary but i try to encourage people not to give in to that fear still come out there and do your best to make sure that you fulfill your civic responsibility of voting when the time comes but it's something we need to do something about in terms of um, I know applying the laws the way they should be applied and avoiding that people are intimidated on election days. Do you feel that voter intimidation is a sign of things to come? You mentioned Oshun, um, the elections in Oshun State. Do you think we should expect to be intimidated when we go to the polls? Absolutely. I think we all need to be ready. APC is not uh, willing to accept that the people have said no to them and they but are have ready. The people really said no. I mean, they won I, the Osho election. They didn't win the Osho election. I don't know why you think they won the Osho election. I don't think they won the Osho election. The election was concluded on the Saturday and then they saw they had lost and they decided to take it by force. And then that warranted the uh, requiring that the four local government areas that had issues had to be redone. There was no need for that. There were over 600,000 votes that had been cast and that had been accepted and in those 600,000 or so votes 
it was clear that PDP was leading. And then, okay, yeah, they are leading with just a bit of this and uh, the margin or the difference is so much more. That's just stories. So if we're supposed to prepare ourselves to be intimidated, what do we do? How do we protect ourselves? I mean, some people are going to say, look, if this can happen in Oshun, when the elections come, I am not going to risk my life. Is it really worth it? And is it enough to just have that PVC? I think it's not enough to have the PVC, but fortunately, all of us would not have PVCs. There are going to be some who didn't get to register, and those ones have a responsibility to come out and mass and protect those of us who have the PVCs and also help watch what these guys are doing. And then nobody should go to any polling center alone. If you're going to go out there, know that, oh my God, if you go alone, you're an easy target. If you're like two, three, four, you're an easy target. But if you are 50, 200, I don't know how many people are in your polling units, but if all of you can organize yourselves so that you go out there and mass, nobody is going to be able to harass you unless they want to kill everybody in Nigeria. It will be much harder. So what I'm already advocating to my people is don't bother to come out alone because if they see you alone, they can intimidate and harass you. But if you organize yourselves and you come out in like droves, they will be afraid self to come near you. What would you say about technology? What role can technology and in particular social media play in managing the scourge of voter intimidation? You can tell that social media played a great role in letting everybody see what was happening in Oshun State during the run. You could tell, you can see so many things happening on YouTube, so many posts on WhatsApp, like people were really sharing media. Now people from their side were not allowed to vote and then the people from the APC side apparently were getting uh, through to be able to vote and all that so we, you could see all of that on social media so I do think that social media has a very 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 important role to play and like I said during the Oshun elections it did play a great role to show the world what was actually happening during the second um, run the rerun during the first one it was like very very interesting like everybody had access people were able to in fact it was a very free and fair election everybody was happy and proud like oh my god this is a good sign of what was to come people, even the contestants were congratulating each other because it was such a close um uh, a competition but at the end of the day pdp won with a few votes and then it became a problem no 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 they couldn't accept the result they needed to have a rerun and so, that rerun was where the problem came through and we thought oh my god i personally think that was a good sign of what we're, what we're going to be seeing in 2019. Okay, so finally, you've spoken about people going en masse. Yes. That means going in droves. Yes. Don't go by yourself Don't to the polling units. But yeah. what can the government do? What security measures can the government place? But the government is the one killing the people and preventing them from... Why are you talking about government when they are the ones that's the problem? The problem is not false. The problem is not that people don't want people to come and vote. Everybody wants everybody to come and vote because you actually don't know who they are going to be voting for. You don't know if they are coming on, on your behalf or against you. All you know is that they are coming to vote. So you're not going to be harassing anybody unless you have personal beef with the person and you know the person is going to vote against you. And that would be like once in a while that people know exactly who is against them. Otherwise, you don't know. You don't know me. I don't know you. You don't know who I'm going to support. You're going to just be hoping that I'm going to support you. So the person or the people who are going to be worried about what the voters are doing are actually the government agencies. And they're not the ones that are saying we should be advising. It's useless advice, my dear sister, because they're not going to be taking anything we're telling you uh, 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 on board. Because for, as far as they are concerned, once they feel like, oh my God, we need to read, they will do whatever is necessary, beat people up, prevent them from coming, avoid that the media people. Because you have a lot of cameras, you have a lot of observers reporting like real time what's going on. They will stop those people from getting their jobs done so that they can manipulate the results. That won't be happening from the opposition. It will be happening from the government. So if you're telling us what the police will do, what the army will do, they know what to do. But there's nothing to tell them because they won't do what they should do since they are the ones that are trying to intimidate people and prevent them from voting. So absolutely no trust in this government to secure the lives of voters. Thank you so much for all these contributions on our topic of the day. Now we'll be moving to politics and more where Eunice will open up to us why she got involved in politics and her big plans for Nigeria if she is voted into the number one position in the land come February 2019. Do stick around. Political Politica. Politics for everyone. You're still tuned in to Political Politica with me, your host, Isabella Akinshea. Before the break, I sat down with presidential aspirant Eunice Atuegide about 
voter intimidation and she had some very strong words for the government but now we turn the focus on her journey into politics so politics was this something that was always there from childhood did you were you one of those children when i grew up i want to be the president of nigeria oh yes i definitely was that child who was telling everybody i will be the president of nigeria but it wasn't because i understood anything about politics i never really fully grasped what politics in nigeria was all about until i got to law school a few years ago and we were trying to help our, school, our fellow students and some of the people in the communities were always coming to us for all sorts of assistance and we realized that come we can't even help so many there's just a few we could um, do stuff for help pay school fees help with feeding and so your passion accommodation. for wanting to help people led yes. you into no politics. absolutely so we we got together especially those of us who had studied abroad we thought no we couldn't just ignore this and go back and we're all comfortable in the end our kids are coming back to both these things and they will have probably much more bigger problems to solve than we have now so we have to get in the ring Initially, we thought, okay, let's start with um, pressure groups, but we realized that pressure groups are only useful during the elections. After the elections, they are ignored. So we said, okay, let's go into one of the parties en masse and then try and get ourselves up to the top and take it over. And then we realized that parties are actually more or less controlled by specific groups and you can't get in and get up the way you see in foreign uh, countries. So we realized, okay, the, we decided the best thing was for us to actually uh, set up a political party, ground it properly in ideologies, and then build from there through to the future. We're not necessarily so much in a hurry, but fortunately for us, within the first two years, we're able to get registered. And we thought, okay, now that we're registered before the elections, let's make sure we get out there. Initially, it was to bring all the independent candidates, the new faces together, and get them to um, contest under the National Interest Party because we have a very transparent system all our um, elections are done online and every member has a voice. So for the presidential election, for example, all the members of NIP would be involved in deciding who becomes the candidate of the party. It wouldn't be delegates or there was no opportunity for anybody to bribe anybody or manipulate the system. But we're not able to get them together. Um, everybody seems to think they could do it alone. Ah, okay, I can do it alone. And then we now started deliberating, especially after the Omorele Showere saga, where he misled us to think he was really coming to NIP, and we made room for him, and then eventually himself and his people didn't come. So after that, we thought, come, we're chasing all these people, but my team members, particularly our party leader, that, you know, you're actually better qualified than all these people you've been chasing for six months. Have you ever considered your sex, being a woman, as an advantage as well as a disadvantage in, in playing politics in Nigeria? I have never thought of it in terms of uh, advantage or disadvantage in the politics itself, but I have indeed thought about it in terms of deliberate attempts by political parties to just not let you come through, probably because you're a woman. And that was one of the things that we thought at NIP, we would not have to have those kind of problems. So it's not up to anybody to decide who actually gets the ticket. The people who are contesting have all the freedom to um convince the members to vote for them but it's not up to any godfather or godmother to decide who goes whether male or female so it's like a very level playing ground for everybody in nip i don't have that problem of gender not at all of course there are people with their biases but they cannot really influence what's going on other than try to convince their own people not to vote for the person because she's a woman other than that we don't have that problem at nip i like how you mentioned godfather godmother because some people will say this party that you went to start, NIP, where is the funding coming from? Who is behind you? Is this really what you want to do? Or is somebody sponsoring all of this? What would you say to that? There is no sponsors. We don't have those kind of money bags that will come out and drop like 100 million or 300 million or a billion or whatever to um, fund the party. It's really members do what they can like every month there are people that absolutely every month they donate their two thousand one thousand ten thousand five thousand and then we took out a lot of loans to make sure that we can get through at least get the first phase done and then when we have more members we know that uh, even though we don't charge anybody any fees we try to keep money as far away from the core of nip as possible so that people can give money according to their abilities if you have a million to give that's fine if it's just a hundred naira you have that's fine 
So we don't impose bill, uh, uh, costs or subscription fees or anything on anybody, but we do encourage our members to give back to the party. And we have programs where we're going to be employing strictly members, maybe like my law firm, my uh, property company, my friends that have consultancies, I have some too. We're going to be employing strictly M NIP members. And then, of course, they're going to be getting their salaries, their health insurances or whatever. And we're going to insist that their tithe comes to NIP because we are the ones that are providing. I like that. No, their seriously. tithe comes yeah. to NIP. Yeah, I mean, you have to be grateful for the people who are providing for you. And that's actually it's because of NIP that you are going to get these jobs. You are going to have your insurance. Your kids are going to be feeding. You're going to be able to travel every now and then again when you gather up enough savings. But every month you need to pay back to the party at least 10% of whatever you are earning. It's not too much to ask. And you're going to give it anyway to church or somebody or somewhere, something in gratitude. But the person you should be most grateful for or to is actually the political party that is giving you this opportunity. So it's going to be an on, 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 it's a good convention that we know we'll have to impose on our people to make sure that the party gets the funding it needs to run on its own. So there will never be a time that godfathers are needed to get the party uh, running or to get the policies played. So we'll be able to rely on what's coming back from our members. So those are some of the things we look at. We're going to have investments. We're going to have investments in our members. And we're going to expect them to at least show some gratitude by paying these Tights back to us. Can you tell me some of the ideologies? Because you mentioned that what separates NIP from the rest? Because a lot of people say in Nigeria we don't really practice ideology based politics, but you're yeah. saying you're doing it differently. Absolutely. The first thing you have to understand when you talk about ideologies, whether you're going left or right, or whether yeah, that's whether you are going into the socialist style or the capitalist style. But NIP, we said we're going to stay in the middle. We're going to do politics that is socialist in nature but also politics that is capitalist in nature because uh, the world has developed far too much beyond that point where you have to just go strictly socialism and then it, 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 so you're middle center we're very very central we are saying we have to allow the government regulate but we have to allow the private sector to thrive so we are very very centrally idea uh, a central ideological party and we say okay uh, we will do a lot of work to coordinate and regulate, but we also have to allow the economy, a very free economy, so that the, the, the country can actually develop faster and move forward a lot faster than we have had so far. Globally, which party would you say you identify with their ideologies? And which politicians, women, men, would you say you look up to and draw inspiration from? Personally. Um, I think the, the person I like most is actually Bill Clinton. I I see a lot of uh, similarities between us. He's a people's person. He likes to go in there and mix with the people, mingle with them, chat with them, get to actually understand their problems. And he's a very friendly, he has a very friendly and um, body language. You know, Obama is very distant and I'm too good. I'm an orator and it's harder to approach him and just come and be nice and friendly. He like Clinton is stay your way, just stay out of my way kind of person. But Bill Clinton embraces everything. Bill Clinton and Michelle Obama are very similar, always hugging and holding people and communicating with them. So I like him and I kind of feel that's more like me. I'm the Michelle Obama. Uh, so Michelle Clinton Obama, kind of Bill Clinton. What about locally? Locally. No, nothing <laughs> like that. <laughs> like who? Uh, no, no, no. I don't have any such inspiration from any of our politicians. I don't think, I can't even, on the like, no, I can't think of anybody. That would say, ah, I really like this person's style. I would like to be like him or her. No, 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 really. And if for some reason you're not able to win come February 2019, mm -hmm. will you stop politics and go back to the businesses you do? Or is this going to be a lifelong thing for this you? This is a lifelong thing, but it doesn't affect the businesses I do. For now, yes, because I had to put so much time and energy and funds into helping build and uh, register NIP and then helping um the parties so i don't expect to have so much responsibilities for nip after the 2019 elections so i'll probably be doing an oversight kind of function where people are doing all the leg runs and i am actually basically just giving instructions and staying in my business i have to go back to my business because somebody has to be making the money the party is not going to run on on paper so somebody needs to be developing the businesses so that the members can have where to you know, get the jobs that they need to feed themselves. So at the end of the day, I can't do politics without doing my business. I've got to do my business in order to be able to even get the funding 
to do some of the politicking and some of the empowerment jobs that I said to myself I have to do. But there is no going back. For me, I'm in the race for life. Like, I'm never going to leave the political arena in Nigeria. I will always put my time. I will always put my money. I will always put my experiences. I'm, in, I'm here to stay. I'm not coming in there to quickly look at what's there. And if there's nothing for me, I could go home and forget it. No, I'm here to serve. And service is something I have to do. It's one I'll do for the rest of, rest of my life. So there's no, no, you will see units every day. Yeah? <laughs> you know, I always trend nowadays. Mm, I'll probably be trending for the rest of my life. I, I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with that at all. I'm in this game to stay. <music> Welcome back to Political Political with me, your host, Isabella Akishe. Now we turn our focus to Project Nigeria, where we ask our guests what their big plans are for the nation. So what would a new Nigeria look like under your administration? Oh, wow. The new Nigeria would have electricity two for seven. The new Nigeria would have functional educational establishments with state-of-the-art equipment and great teachers. The new Nigeria would make sure that all our workers get their salaries on the 28th of every month. It doesn't matter whether they are earning a lot or a little, because as long as the people know that every 28th of every month, my money is coming in, they will plan. They will plan. They would know, okay, even if I have to take a loan in order to meet some big ex expenses, I will be able to pay off whatever my expenses are based on my inflow. I know that every month I get 18,000 naira, which is still the minimum wage we are all agreeing about. But at least I'm able to allocate 2,000 to my uh, feeding, allocate 5,000 to my clothing, allocate two, uh, uh, 200 to my uh, uh, transport. And then you, have, you plan yourself. So your children are not suddenly hungry. And then because somebody is owing you salary for a whole year, sometimes a year and a half, people are owing people salaries for that long. So if I, if I can make it a crime, if you do not pay somebody's salary on the 28th of every month, then you go to jail. Then I'll do that if it's possible to do that within the law. Because we need to make sure that the people have predictability. They can plan with that which they have. So people don't have to think about evil. They have to think about kidnapping others, uh, robberies, and then coming into politics for the purpose of stealing from the coffers. At least you guarantee life, standard of living that is acceptable to the people. You know, that's what my new Nigeria is going to look like. In Nigeria that functions and that works for everybody. Where law and order and rule of law is obeyed. Nobody is above anybody else. If you commit a crime, you do the time. If you don't want to do the time, do not commit the crime. You're treated equal with the next man. You are not much more important because you are in the Senate or in the wherever it is you are. You do what is right, and if you don't, you get punished for it. So a new Nigeria under my administration is a Nigeria where all of us will be proud to be Nigerians. Whether we are home or abroad, we'll be saying, wow, we didn't even think this was possible. But it's all possible. It's all possible because the worst of our problems is in leadership. We have really, really, really horrible people. I like, I like how you're going to leadership. But what I'd like to ask is corruption. That's the big one. And a lot of times politicians come out and say, once I get into power, I'm going to treat corruption. And then corruption fights back. But what would be your solution, a lasting solution to the problem of corruption? Don't let it happen. That's the easiest way to fight corruption. Prevent it from happening. And that's actually very easy to do because everybody can police everybody else. Do you understand? You put in uh, 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 surveillance systems everywhere. Every office, every public officer is a public officer and everything they do is in the public eye. Make sure that you have recordings in their, in their offices. Make sure that you follow every transaction they are doing. Set them up. Organize for people to walk into the courts and start a court case that looks so serious and so real. But it's only just to see which of the judges would request for bribes to do their job. Organize for foreigners to come into this country and negotiate deals with all these governors and all these uh, ministers and whatever they are. Expose them. Make sure the entire country is seeing what they are doing wrong while you are punishing them or removing them from office. Don't make it secret, secret, because if you're making it secret, you're increasing the problem. Put it out there. Allow transparency and accountability to happen, but make sure you too, you are accountable. Because if you are making any mistake, they can blackmail you. But if you keep your hands clean, everybody else must keep theirs clean too, because you are ready to get rid of anybody who isn't keeping his or her hands clean. It will be very, very easy to fight corruption in Nigeria by preventing that it happens at all. 
So leadership by example. 100%. Well, being a woman, if you were the first female president in Nigeria, what will it be like to be a woman in politics under your administration? Oh, you would be rest assured that you would have an open ground, a level playing ground to showcase your talent, to do whatever it is that you believe is your um, talent. Like you come out there, if you want to be the next minister, you showcase your talent, you show us your CV, tell us what you are going to do as the minister, maybe for education, for example. Let the men come in and compete with you. If you are the better person for the job, you are getting it. We do our background checks on you. We see that you have lived a clean life. We see that your CV speaks really good language. You come out there, you present yourself, and we can tell that, oh my God, this is an amazing addition to the government. You are coming in. And if we have so many women coming out like that, we are selecting. And if there are more women that really look like they can deliver, then there, there will be more women in power than there are men. I'm not one of those people that tell you you must do 30% or 35%. No, I'm the person that tells you allow everybody to show what they have got and pick the best. If at the end of the day, the best is 100% women, then 100% women will come in. But if there are men that make it like impossible for us to pick, then of course the men will come in, the women will come in, and it will be much more balanced that way. Enough of this, let, let them come because they are men, let them come because they are my brothers and sisters, let them come because they are my village, let them come because they are from my uh, tribe or my religion, enough of that. Let's pick people that are the best. Yes, we must consider all the areas. Yes, we must go through all the requirements for federal character to ensure that there is inclusivity, there is, uh, what is diversity and inclusion. But it doesn't mean that we can just take anything and anyone just because we are trying to balance it out. We still must take the best from every region. And that's what my government would definitely guarantee. We're not going to put mediocre people in power because we're trying to balance power out. We can balance power out with the best of Nigeria. And that's what we're going to be doing. So a government based on meritocracy, yes. only the best get the jobs, whether only they're the, men or they're women. Your gender doesn't matter at all. Your area of origin matters. So we're going to definitely consider your place of origin. However, it's only in terms of picking the best from that your place of origin, not just picking somebody because he's from Abia or, or Akwaibom or Zamfara or whatever. The best from Zamfara comes. So the place of origin doesn't matter in the grand scheme? It matters. It absolutely matters because you have to balance power out to make sure you are fitting it into the requirements, constitutional requirements of federal character, which is actually equal to uh, uh, so what diversity and if inclusivity. The quality is not the same throughout the federation. So it will not be the same. But your job is not to pick the best throughout the federation. Because if you do that, you may end up having just one tribe or just one religion or just one sex or just, you know, you may have a problem. So it is necessary to pick the best from every region. And the good thing is, when you pick the best from every region and put them in the center, you have a diversification of ideas. People are bringing their ideas based on their own background, based on their own uh, experiences, based on their own styles, and mixing it with yours. And you have like a, a whole lot of different systems working together to drive the country forward. And because you have picked the best from every region, everybody is actually, they know that they are there because of quality, not because of relationship with them. So they are ready to show off all their talents and give the most they can to the country. That's the way, best way to pick leaders in Nigeria. Make sure it is by merit so that those ones who get in there, they know that forget it. Not because you'd be my brother. Not because that woman are my boyfriend or girlfriend. Not just because, say, I water and I are they, they deliver more. Wow, very interesting Nigeria. It will be under your administration. Now we switch things up on a lighter note. We go to our quick fire segment where the first answer she gives is the right answer or maybe the wrong answer. Oh Eunice, my. are you ready? Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds scary. Number one, the first female governor will emerge in the next elections. True or false? True. Number two, the party that will dominate in 2019 is? APC. Number three, young people have what it takes to become leaders because? They're hardworking. Number four, yeah. the funniest thing I've read about myself online. My shaku shaku is bay. Is your shaku shaku bay? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to check. <laughs> Number five, 
Number five, the candidate I am most afraid of. Buhari. Number six, Nigerians will vote with their stomach or their brain. Most stomach. Number seven, if not you, who? Fela Drotoye. Okay. There you have it. Very interesting answers, but I would say very honest answers. So now we take a look at what's happening on the political landscape before we give our guests a final chance to make a case to you, our viewers. Enjoy. Political Politica with Isabella Akinshaye. And it's almost a wrap on Political Politica with me, your host, Isabella Akinshaye. But first, we let our guest, Eunice Atuejide, to really share her last words. So I want you to imagine, you know, you're taking your last breath. So you can take a deep breath. <laughs> Yes, one very deep <laughs> breath. And then yeah. I want you to look into your camera mm. and deliver your final words to Nigerians and to the world. Yeah, I'm here for you. I'm here in this race because I want us to birth a Nigeria that works for all of us together. And we're not going to do it by sitting at home, especially those of us who consider ourselves elites. You need cannot win election with stomach infrastructure people because I don't get money to give person. But you now that you're coming from the bank, you that you are the bank manager and you that you are the director of that company and you that you are the minister's brother or sister or wife or come out, I beg. Hmm? David, don't no go just sit down because your papa don't win, Abi, your uncle don't win now. Abi, what if they even do ourselves? They're collecting mandates. You know, we can't come out for main election. Presidents, I beg everybody, please come out. If the elites come out, we won't have a repeat of what we had in 2014 will be able to put units in power. And I beg you all, come out for me. I am worth your vote. Thank you. Wow, that was a very long breath. <laughs> <sighs> but thank you so much for being on Political Politica today. And we wish you all the best. Thank and you. we'll continue to see what you're doing. And if you do get into power, please let us no, let's come there. Let's find out. Let's hold you accountable because you always spoke about transparency to all the things you've promised on the show today. You wish rest assured you'll have access, 100% free access. No restrictions. Promised. There you have it. 100% access. Not something you hear often from politicians, but Eunice will be different. She says she is a woman of the people for the people. But come February 2019, we'll find out if she is by the people. You can keep the conversation going online. I want to hear from you. Do you agree with some of the views from our guests today? Please go online. Follow us on social media. We are at Political Politica on Facebook and Instagram and PP with Isabella on Twitter. And that's where we wrap up this episode of Political Politica. But I remind you that politics is not just for the old is not just for the young, it is for everyone. So play a part and stay woke.